It's 1 o'clock here on 90.3 KEXP here in Seattle. I'm Stevie Zoom in for Cheryl for the Midday Show with you for uh, another hour. That set just finished up with the British band Fanfarlo, and that was a song called Deconstruction. Right now, we want to welcome back to KEXP and welcome back to Seattle, Steve Earle. Thank you, sir, for being here again. It's my job. It's your job. <laughs> it's, it's my job, and I'm glad I have one. The Low Highway is the brand new album released this week by Steve Earle and the Dukes and Duchesses. And later on this evening, early the evening, 6.30 p.m., Steve Earle will be performing over at uh, Silver Platters, the Queen Anne store. That's at 6.30. Yeah, uh, and it's just me um, for this. We'll be back with the band later to take care of serious business. But this is, you know, it's a promotional tour. So I'm traveling around to record stores. And this is record store week. We're leading up to record store day on Saturday. So we're trying to make as many of those as possible. We'll be Music Millennium tomorrow and and end up at Twist and Shout in Denver on Saturday for Record Store Day itself. You did so. this, the last uh, album, a couple years ago. I did. It happened to come out around the same time of year. and uh, But it's it's one of those things. I, I You know, it's funny, you know, these record stores that kind of banded together and have survived everything. You know, it's it's different. We used to make records for girls. Now we make them for nerds. And uh, so vinyl's becoming a, a big deal. A lot of things I thought we'd never see happen, you know, and... Um, but it's kind of fun. I just, this record, you know, getting the, you know, I'm actually, my last three records have been, there's been vinyl, and uh, I'm starting to reissue some some back stuff that never was out on vinyl and vinyl, the stuff that I that I have the power to do that and, you know, can do that, and uh, it's kind of fun. The vinyl nerds will be happy to hear about some of those coming out. But it's, become, it's going beyond that. You know, the thing about it is almost anybody that listens to music, I think my preferred, even, I even got a turntable, and I didn't think I ever would because I've never been that particular about what I listen to music on. I listen on my phone as much as I do anything else. But but for my preferred purchase format now is vinyl with a with a download code. That's That, co- kind of, that covers my whole life if I get a chance to do that because i got a kind of a decent sound system again. All right, that's good to hear. You ready for some music? Yeah, it's kind of what I do. So, let's see. This is a. Uh, this is uh, well. This is the low highway. Traveling at on the low highway. 3,000 miles to the Frisco Bay Across the rivers wide and along some plains Up a coast and down and back again I saw empty houses on dead end streets People lining up for something to eat Ghost of America watching me Through the broken windows in the factory Naked bones of a better day As I roll down the low highway Traveling out on the low highway by the yellow moon and a light of day, snow white crown on a mountain top to the valley down where the shadows fall. Met a man with a rifle in his hand. Been away to battle in a distant land. We taught him to hate, taught him to kill. Now he's out on the road with a hole to fill. Nobody knows the price he paid. So he's taking his toll on the low highway.
windows down and listening. We was turning around on the asphalt scene. Every sound is a prophecy. I heard an old man grumble and a young girl cry. Brick wall crumble and the white dove fly. Call for justice and a cry for peace. The voice of reason and the roar of the beast. Every mile is a prayer I prayed. As I rode down the low highway. So, the low highway um, had the best band I've ever had out uh, on the road, and knew I wanted to make a record with that band, and you know started writing songs. And I was writing songs for Treme, which is a TV show I was in, which is about post Katrina New Orleans, and the story of post Katrina New Orleans is linked directly to these sort of uh, economic times that we're going through, because that's kind of what happened in New Orleans is. The reason things, half the people are still gone and things aren't fixed is because there weren't any funds to fix them and times are tough out there. So um, I start writing about what I'm seeing out the window and songs to kind of go along with that. That gives me a start. And um, I, the epiphany was that what I was seeing out the window of the bus was something closer to what Woody Guthrie saw than anybody that does my job has seen in a long time. We all do this job that Bob Dylan invented in as he was sort of creating himself in Woody Guthrie's image, and we'd all done it with one foot in the 30s, you know, one foot in the Depression, one foot in the Dust Bowl. Music that's stylistically linked to that. And, um, you know, songs about hard times. And even nowadays, it's even a fashion statement that's linked to the 30s for singer-songwriters that are coming up. And, um, you know, um, they think, well, they're dressing like the band, but the band were dressing like the 30s. So it's, you know... It, but the weird thing is, is none of us, including Bob, ever had that, ever experienced that, ever witnessed that firsthand until now. So this record ended up being about that. And one of the things that, uh, one of the first songs that was written was uh, about, I, I play secondary and tertiary markets and uh play small and medium-sized towns and uh, where all it takes is one great big huge big box store owned by um, a family with no conscience to come in to completely destroy an entire downtown. I was bored with no limitations Said my goodbyes in the Greyhound station Here I am, I have a mob from where I grew up In a parking lot, sitting in a pickup truck And I'm thinking about burning it down, boys Thinking about burning it down Nothing's ever gonna be the same in this town Ten gallons of gas and a bottle of propane Electric igniter off my grill and I still can't Say for a sudden this thing will blow But if it doesn't gonna be the first one to know And I'm thinking about burning it down, boys Thinking about burning it down Nothing's ever gonna be the same in this town I'm thinking about burning the Walmart down Someday and settle down. Now I'm getting old, no place else to go. 
It's all coming well So I'm watching the faces come and go in Some of them strangers and some that I know in It doesn't matter much how long I wait Cause the door's always open and it's never too late And I'm thinking about burning it down Thinking about burning it down Nothing's ever gonna be the same in this town I'm thinking about burning it down, boys Thinking about burning it down Nothing's ever gonna be the same in this town I'm thinking about burning the Walmart down I'm Thinking about burning the wild mud down I'm thinking about burning it down Ninety point three KEXP here in Seattle. You're listening to live music from Steve Earle. That is burning it down and the first one, the title song, The Low Highway, Steve Earle and the Dukes and Duchesses, the new album this week. And again, thanks for being here. And uh, Steve will be over at Silver Platters, the Queen Anne store, at 6.30 this evening. Tomorrow, if you're in Portland, he'll be at Music Millennium at 6 p.m. And then we can all have a look at you on Late Night again next week. Yeah, Monday. Uh, Letterman's Monday. And then we rehearse for three days, and the tour starts uh, the following thir- no, following Friday night in uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And uh, then it's coffee breaks over, everyone back on your heads. Yeah. Here we go. You were just talking about what you're observing out that window. Is there, is there still room for optimism for us? Sure, I'm an optimist. I yeah. started having kids again when I was 55. Um, but I don't, um, you know, it's, it doesn't, nothing gets fixed by asking, you know, if somebody said, uh, it's really, well, it's actually a guy named Delbert Tibbs who's a poet. And he's one of the characters in The Exonerated, which was a play I was on in Off-Broadway. And um, there's a part in the play, and it's Delbert's. It's a quote from Delbert. He said, um, you know, you don't fix um, what's wrong with America by asking what's right with it. Why isn't anybody ever talking about, you know, people will say, well, everybody's talking about what's wrong. Well, you don't go out and you don't drive into a garage and say, what's right with my car? You know, you ask what's wrong with your car, and you try to fix that stuff. And and uh, so that's what some of this is about. I mean, I think um, things are genuinely tough out there. I don't know what the difference between – a recession and a depression is when it goes on this long. Yeah, I don't see, no one's been able to uh, explain that to me. Yeah. I just want to talk about the new record for a moment. You got to, This is a band record again. Yeah, I mean, band record, I made a lot of records with that were mostly made with the Dukes. Uh, Copperhead Road was mostly made with the Dukes, but it was also a track with the Pogues and a track with a band called Tell You Ride, which was sort of a acoustic music supergroup. It was like Jerry Douglas and Bella Fleck and Sam Bush and... Um, Edgar Meyer. Um, and, you know, I did stuff like that. The Del McCurry Band, the first, my first recording with the Del McCurry Band was on El Corazon on one track. And, you know, so those records didn't quite qualify as Dukes records. This is all the band, and we made it in five days. We just set up. We basically loaded off the bus into a studio, recorded, looked got back on the bus, and went back out on the road in the middle of a tour. And, uh, well, the end of a tour. The last, the second, you know, generally, you know, you make a record, especially if you release it in winter, spring, then you spend the summer that follows it, you know, out touring, and then there's usually a second summer before you actually make another record again. And a lot of times, records get written during those those second summers. I think that's it. For bands that tour, there's a bread and butter like, like we are. And that's what I do, whether I tour the band or whether I tour by myself. I this That's what the music business is now. It's a glad thing. I'll, it's, you know, I'm, I'm glad I like it, you know, um, because touring is, there's not as much mailbox money in the music business as there used to be. You have to tour, you have to work. Yeah. So. You got back together with uh, your buddy uh, Ray Kennedy to yeah. co-produce this record. Yeah. The last one you did was with T-Bone. Now you got back together with Ray. Well, Ray and I have never stopped working together. He yeah. mixed towns. You know, I recorded it um, in New York in my apartment. And he mixed it. He's mixed a lot of projects that I've done, you know, tracks here and there since. We never we never stopped working together. Um, and production projects. He recorded and mixed the John Bias record that I produced. So, um, and he's going to record and mix a Marianne Faithful record that I'm getting ready to make in November, and uh, which is going to be it's going to be a trip. I can't wait. Um, the very first song I ever sang in front of people was was As Tears Go By at a talent show when I was seventh 
in seventh grade, and uh, and I won an honorable mention. And uh, it's uh, Marianne and I have a lot of other connections too. So we've been we've been friends for a while, and we've been t- talking about doing this. And I think it's it's, it's actually going to happen. Yeah, I know you were in San Francisco yesterday, and one of the songs on the new one for uh, Warren Hellman, the man of uh, uh, Hardly Strictly Bluegrass. Yeah. Little, yeah, it's a little banjo tune for him. Yeah, it was written because, you know, Warren Hellman um, was a banjo player. You know, I'll, I'll remember him as a banjo player rather than an investment maker. Uh, he uh, he was the guy that brought you Hardly Strictly Bluegrass. And also the, the man that's single-handedly responsible for anyone that works for the city of San Francisco that it's collecting a pension right now is owes it to Warren because the the after this – their pension system, like every other pension system, was tied to stocks, and this collapse on Wall Street had threatened the San Francisco. San Francisco's pension system took a really big hit and was about to collapse, and Warren wrote one check. So every teacher, every cop, every fireman, anybody that draws a city check in San Francisco that's retired in the last few years, I was having any kind of retirement at all to, to Warren Hellman. He was a good guy, and uh, he was my favorite capitalist, and uh, he changed um, – his mind about a lot of stuff that he believed. He stopped voting as a Republican, started voting as an independent, and he voted against Bush and and uh, the second election and all that stuff. You know, he changed his ideas about a lot of stuff and, 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 and credits me with some of it. And I, you know, learned that not everybody that um, on the other side of this issue is doing it because they're evil. They're doing it because they they believe something that is, just isn't true. They've been told a lie and they bought it. They've been told a lie all their lives. And capitalism's not um, not evil in and of itself. It's like not believing in capitalism's like it's not Santa Claus. It doesn't go. It's a force of nature. It doesn't go away just because you don't believe in it. Um, it's but it's also not a religion, and it and the market won't take care of anything the market has no conscience it has no soul the market does what the market does and 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 thinking that the market is gonna the 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 biggest lie out there is the reason that things aren't good is because we've never ever let the market just do what it'll do it's all that we've always interfered with and that's simply a lie we've not interfered we've come close to closer to not interfering with it all in the last 10 or 20 years, the last couple of generations, and uh, maybe even, and um, and we're in a lot of trouble right now because of that. It's, it's just one of those deals. And Warren and I talked about all that stuff, and he died really suddenly in, you know, of, a, of a form of leukemia that usually doesn't kill people. Um, it was one of those things. It was it was tough. It was tough for everybody. But there's going to be a Hardly Strictly for at least another 10 years. And as um, long as there's one, I'll be in Golden Gate Park the first week of October every year. That's good to hear. I know a lot of my friends down in the Bay Area have uh, seen you and have been going to uh, Hardly Strictly Bluegrass for a number of years, and we'll continue to look forward. It's absolutely free. It's five stages. It's great music for four days yeah. in in San Francisco every year the first weekend in October. I want to get you to. I want to mention something else here. This uh, aside from the the new album uh, musically, you are uh, a part of this uh, songs for Slim. Yeah, Slim Dunlap from the Replacements who had a stroke. And yeah. there's some uh, songs that uh, bands and you and other people have been recording to uh, uh, help them out in that regard. And the one with you came out a month ago, I believe. It's called Times Like This. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a song of slums that I really dug, and I was really lucky to get it because I think people kind of fought over it. And uh, uh, Joe Henry produced it. It was also a chance to work with Joe, who's been a friend of mine for a long time and has wanted to produce my last three records, so we finally got it. It didn't quite win the sweet stakes for whatever reason. Uh, eventually, I'll probably make a record with Joe Henry, but I got to do a track with him, and it was a blast. And I knew Slim, and I knew, you know, those guys and I are the same graduating class. And, and uh, you know, I did, did part of a tour with The Replacements back before Slim was in the band, but Paul decided to do a handstand on the stage at the Ritz, and somebody grabbed it, a punter. In the pit, grabbed his wrist, and Stinson thought it would be funny to poke him in the butt with his guitar, and he went over into the pit and broke his wrist. And it was, you could hear it in the wings over the replacements. And, um, you know, that ended the tour. So <laughs> that was it. That's kind of how I got to know those guys. And Slim, he had a stroke, and he's just not bouncing back from it, you know, and it's been really tough. And, and um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. But, um, 
the first single was these are all been for auction and um you know it's it's one of those things it's just really kind of community it's like i said we make records for nerds now and it sort of pays off in some areas when you want to raise money for something you can do these these really um severely limited you know pieces of music eventually that'll probably be more widely available but you know because some somebody will bootleg it for for one thing you can pretty much count on it but but uh the first single was a replacement single the first replacements recording in a long time and then and then mine was the second one and uh it's uh it was cool it was an honor to be part of yeah everybody that i know that's saw the band so many times back in the day and they've always got a story that what they witnessed on stage in addition to the music you have a well you know what the truth of the matter with, with replacements gigs and i saw a bunch of them um because i was on them i probably saw I, I probably saw them play seven or eight times and i saw one really great show out of seven or eight and and so the fact of the matter is if you caught them on a good night you didn't see anything you didn't nothing happened they would play and uh if you caught them on the other nights then they'd play Green Acres and and you know like like cartoon themes and stuff and and uh, uh, there was a fair amount of contempt for their audience which I was never quite with but it was uh, it was kind of hard to watch sometimes but they uh, didn't have much respect for people that paid a lot of money to see them sometimes I have to I'm I'm afraid yeah you ready for a couple of more songs yeah um, right. what am I playing oh yeah um, in my neighborhood in New York City. Um, and this connects to, this is the only New York City song, I think, on this record, which is, hasn't happened in a long time, because um, this is where I live. But uh, I, uh, there's a church, and I walk past it on my way to the gym, you know, every day when I'm home. And Tim Robbins grew up in my neighborhood, and he and I have been friends for some time, and we were, um, he's recently fled New York City for a while, but um, he's living in California now, but he... Uh, he uh, and I were walking past the church, and, and he said, you know, I was an altar boy in that church. And I said, wow, you know, that this, things are really getting tough. They must be because, you know, they've just opened up a soup kitchen in that church. And he said, no, nah, man, there's always been a soup kitchen in that church since I was a little boy. And it dawned on me that what I was seeing was not a new soup kitchen. What I was seeing was a higher demand for a soup kitchen, therefore the line was going out the door in up Sixth Avenue. So and it it just, you know these are, you know, people in my neighborhood that um that uh come there and people from outside the neighborhood probably that came to get something to eat and there's more and more of them every day and, and you know, we choose sometimes like what's visible to us and what's not. <laughs> Hold of my shoe, I don't mind, cause it keeps me connected to the ground when I'm feeling like maybe if I ain't careful, I'll just blow away. Then the lightning strikes, the thunder rolls, and I'm okay. Rumble underground 
I just want to say I, look, I had a look at that video this morning of that song, and it, it almost had the feel of it that, as if you directed that. Tim Blake Nelson directed it. And um, I don't know, you know who Tim is. He's an actor and a writer. If you saw um, Oh Brother, Where Out Thou, he was the little short, you know, kind of goofy-looking inmate. Uh, he's, uh, he also wrote and directed a film I was in called Lisa Grass. And uh, Tim, you know... Um, He's from Oklahoma. He's from from Tulsa. Um, he's a Jew from Tulsa, which is like you know starts out, you know, kind of weird right there all by itself, and uh, kind of a unique way to grow up. And he's uh, his he went to Brown. He and Davis Guggenheim were roommates there, and he's kind of might be the smartest guy I know, and I know some smart guys, and uh, he's. Um, he just uh, he wrote a part for me in a film that ended up not getting made because the star went off to make a pirate movie and you know scheduling thing and so the funding went away and and uh, then he wrote another part for me for this in this other film and we got to be friends and he I asked him to direct this clip and and he scripted it it freaked my manager out because you know I come from the 80s and a lot of video clips got made and you got these treatments that were like. Uh, you know, they were like, uh, let's see, um, uh, an old car sitting in a lonely street, and then the band is set up in the middle of the street, and then you just sort of let art flow over you. And it was like, you know, all these really ambiguous one-page treatments were what most videos were shot on and funded based on. Tim wrote a script, shot for shot, and um, beginning with them shooting uh, on the Brooklyn Ridge. It was so detailed that I got, at one point in the process i was i was on the road i was doing traveling all over the place doing you know it's just playing shows on the west coast solo shows out here and uh i flew into town and i wasn't able to be there for the day that they shot all the stuff you know that i wasn't in all the conceptual stuff with the homeless guy who's not really a homeless guy he's a really good actor whose name i can't remember right now which i'm embarrassed about but he's a member of a theater company that tim's in, involved with and um you know, it opens with him coming across the brooklyn bridge and um it um I I come in come up out of the Holland Tunnel and you know in a car coming from Newark and I've seen the shot you know the sketches for costumes and stuff for this this little movie that Tim wrote and I look up and I see one of the characters I saw in the sketches walking through this park and then I see the film equipment and then I see Tim <laughs> and I realize I'm driving past <laughs> my video being shot because you know I, I didn't work in it till the next day and I called him and I tried to get down there but they'd wrapped by the time. I could get out of the car and get my stuff up. I live on a third floor walk up, so like, you know, decarring's not simple sometimes when you live in New York City. So, uh, but it's, I'm really proud of it. I think it might be the best clip that I've ever been involved in. But I, I can't take, I can take almost zero credit for it when it, when it gets right down to it. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, cool. it's got a really good look to it. Yeah. It's, I'm really proud of it. I'm going to get this in, into a really weird tuning that never existed before a few days ago. Because I didn't write this song. Uh, I'm going to do one more. And I wrote this song uh, on um, Mando Cello. And, well, I, I think I wrote it on mandolin, played it on Mando Cello on the record, and, which is a tune's like a mandolin, but way, way, way lower. It's way bigger. So I'm trying to find ways to play it on guitar so I wouldn't have at least on this thing, I wouldn't have to drag so much stuff around, but I think I figured it out because it is about the song. Um, I got a little boy, and his name's John Henry, and he's turned three years old on April 5th. And uh, he's uh, 
when you start having kids as at my age, you know, the math is different. Um, you know, my older boys, Justin and Ian, are having to watch me be a way better father than I was when they were growing up. And that's not lost on me. I, you know, and it, it's, uh, you know, I feel it and I hear about it from time to time. Um, and the other part of it is if I take really good care of myself and nothing weird happens, um, you know, one of the things that we just can't calculate, then I might live long enough to see him through high school, get him into college. And that's just a fact. And it makes you think about it differently. I'm, I'm, the, I'm one of four smart guys that, that dropped out of high school at the same time, kind of my little group of peers. And I belonged to a peer group of exactly four when I was growing up. And uh, they're all gone except me. And I don't know why this is. I'm only 58. But it, I, am reached, I have reached an age where I'm losing people. And um, so it makes you think about it. So I probably in a lot of ways wrote this song because I had to. Because... And, uh, because I needed, felt like I needed to leave something specific behind just in case. And uh, also, John Henry has autism, and he was diagnosed just before his second birthday. And we're on it. He's in a really good school, and he's going to be okay, I think. He's like, he still makes eye contact, and he's socially engaged. He just doesn't talk. He's really smart, and he looks like his mother, and I think he's going to be fine. And we have resources to deal with it. So, But, uh... This is, uh, this is for John Henry. Here we are sitting in the warm sunshine. I'm holding your tiny hand in mine. God knows it ain't gonna be any time before you're grown. I was young when you come along. Chances are long before that day comes. My time in this sweet old world will be done. I'll be gone. You're looking at me. I'm looking at you. God knows than a grown man can do not to break down and cry like a fool when you smile at me I can only hope I do my best with whatever time it is we got left and everything's done and said you remember me remember me on some sunny day whenever things go in your way cause on the day you were born I prayed that's the way to be remember me on stormy night when there's no sign of shelter inside hang your soldier on through to the light cause that's all got angels watching over you your mama don't suffer fools ain't anything she wouldn't do for you I don't believe one of these days you'll be alone and you have to stand up on your own and then when it's muscle and blood and bone Remember me Remember me on some sunny day When everything's going away Summer day you were born I pray that's the way to be Remember me on a storm night When there's no sign of shelter inside That's all you see Remember me Remember me
Thank you very much. You're listening to Steve Earle live here at KEXP. He's going to be over at Silver Platters Record Store, the Queen Anne Store, at 6.30 this evening. Music Millennium in Portland tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. Monday night on TV on uh, Late Night with David Letterman. The Low Highway is the new album this week on New West Label. Again, sir, thanks for being here this afternoon. Thank you. And uh, just thanks for the music and uh, your... uh, the voice and the commentary of what you observe that's going on. It's just well, thanks. It's my job, and I'm just glad I got one. All right. All right, just one more thing here on your quick visit to Seattle. Um, any particular food are you going to have before you uh, leave town? <laughs> well, I've ha- I had a Hangtown Pride this morning and for breakfast, and I'll probably have oysters again before I leave. My th- I probably have 13 coins in my in my future before we leave town because we're going to drive to Portland. So that that's a possibility. So that, that may happen. Almost, it's, it's always open. It's always a possibility. It is. And it's Fine dining by. 24 hours a day. Tonight at Silver Platters, uh, 6.30 p.m. Thanks to our engineer, Kevin. It's 90.3 KEXP, Seattle.